when I was a kid, there was just nobody had a pet. I mean, there was no animals or dogs. And my personal relationship with dogs was, I was terrified of them. Dogs basically were trained to bark at anyone walking by. And the do was somebody walking by. My first thought was, he's not going to be sympathetic, right? It's, yeah. He's just going to be like, dog, fat. But no, he was... He, he said something like, dogs, what, what a special relationship that is, right? And he's looking at her wow. and she goes, yes. And I just remember feeling that as such a healing moment, like that ability to like reach out and hear and see someone's sadness yeah. over, you know, the loss of their dog. He stretches. I mean, he was a, a, had a huge soul. Hello, everyone. My name is Frida Weisel, and on this channel, I explore the culture, history, and stories around Hasidic Jewish communities. Today, I am so delighted to speak with Nomi Seidman on the subject of pets, those special furry friends, and the attitudes towards them within the Hasidic world and ex-Hasidic world. Nomi is a wonderful friend, brilliant woman, scholar, and writer who has joined me on my channel twice before, once to discuss her smash hit podcast, Heretic in the House, which is on hereticism, leaving, and narratives, and once to page through 1950s Orthodox Girls School yearbooks. Nomi serves as the Chancellor Jackman Professor in the Arts at the University of Toronto, and she's the author of several books, including Sarah Chenier and the Beis Yaakov Movement, A Revolution in the Name of Tradition, and the essay, My Father, Myself, in the Anthology of the Derech, Leaving Orthodox Judaism. But on to today's topic, pets. Nomi, welcome and thanks so much. I'm so excited to have this conversation. I'm really, really happy to be talking to you. So, My little doggie's running around. Oh, uh, we want to we want to meet your dog, but I before... hope she'll cooperate. Okay, all right. Dogs are are, you know, they they decide they run the show. So before we get started, I want to explain what made me what prompted me to do this segment. Um, I recently lo lost my very, very beloved dog, Snoopy, and I was in pieces uh, when I met Nomi recently, and Nomi made a comment that we didn't have a chance to discuss further. She said there's something very special about being ex or being OTD and having a dog, and that was all you said. You didn't explain yourself, and I think this is such a big topic. I really appreciate that you agreed to, to continue the discussion here. So can you begin by maybe telling me what your own relationship with animals has been growing up and now, up to now? First of all, I'm so sorry about yeah. Snoopy. And yes, I, I just feel that, I mean, now I feel that dogs touch something so deep in us, some ability to love, some ability, and, and just this connection that we have with creatures of another species um, and the way you can just share a mood and share an afternoon and share a sit and share the enjoyment of food and and it, it there's something very very deep about it and and then losing a pet i mean maybe we'll talk about that too it just you know, you are the world for this pet, like what the pet knows and how the pet looks at you and the pet's belief that you can somehow save them because you have and yeah. and then you can't. Um, but okay, back to the subject of my own relationship with animals, which were very transformed over the course of my life and ha have, I think, a lot to do with the OTD story. So I'll just say that... Um, you know, when people think about leaving the Orthodox world, they think, okay, so you don't eat kosher anymore, you don't keep Shabbos anymore, at least not in the same way. And those are obviously the big things. And then there are all kinds of complicated issues with your family that we've talked about. But there are other things that you don't necessarily think about, you know, but that nevertheless turn out to be a big part of the story too. And one of those is just the ways in which, for some OTD people, not all, because I have OTD friends that are still really not into dogs, um, but for some of us, we've had a kind of odd conversion to, I don't know, dogism, um, to, to, to having a pet, because at least 
when I was a kid, it, there was just nobody had a pet. I mean, there was no animals or dogs. I think there was one student in my whole school who had a dog and had like the, you know, she was kind of almost not ostracized, but considered very, very modern. Like to have a dog was such a not Jewish thing. Um, and my personal relationship with dogs was, I was terrified of them. I mean, the, you'd be walking through, you know, basically Jewish neighborhood, no dogs. And then you have to walk through a block where there's non-Jews and suddenly there's dogs and there's dog be dogs behind fences. And I was terrified and of being bitten by a dog of barking dogs. I was like, I couldn't, I just saw them as malevolent. And there was actually this, um, this verse from the Bible that I said as I walked by them, which was supposed to protect me. Did you have that same thing? Remind me. What was it? So you walk by a dog and you say, oh. There are variants. There are also Yiddish ones. Hint, hint, Isof's kind. Yeah, Tama Vestabasen, Velchripen, Fetiyakov, and Vetutzerasen. It means dog, dog, you're Esau's child. If you will bite me, we will call Uncle Jacob the patriarch and he will tear you up. And what does the, the Hebrew verse mean? The Hebrew verse comes from the, the Exodus story, the Exodus, uh, the story from in Egypt. Exodus of leaving Egypt. And there's a verse there that says that when the people of Israel and the, the Israelites were leaving Egypt, the dogs did not sharpen their tongue against them, whatever that means. The dogs were see. cool with them leaving. I the see. dogs watched without, without you know, barking them. or whatever it was. So the dog, you're reminding the dogs that at some point, Jews and dogs were actually maybe friends. Or, you know, in the case of the, the, the dog, notice that in the case of hint, hint, Isof's kin, what you said in Yiddish, um, the there's an implicit equation here, which is that the dog belongs with the non-Jew, right? The non-Jew right. is Isaac. Right. And who are we? We're Jacob's children, the twin brother. So the right. twin brother of of of. So so there's a conflation here of non-Jews and dogs that goes very very deep, right? So the the very very deep distinction between Jew and non-Jew that you and I both grew up with, which is becoming less and less deep, right, as we leave that world, there's also a way in which the further and further away you get from that very intense set of categories, social categories, you're also able to see a kinship with animals, including pets and dogs. Why do you think in our childhood there were no dogs or cats? What is it that made our childhood or, or from childhood associate animal companions with with Isaac, with with the non-Jewish brother of Jacob? It's an excellent question and it's actually something there's a lot of folk answers to that question right so there's a lot of answers that people give like like uh, animals are not I've heard that animals are muksa, like it, like you're not allowed to touch them on Shabbos. on Shabbos. If you can't touch them on Shabbos, how do you have a pet? Or that animals are somehow um, impure, like this this kind of older category. Well, they um, are of the category of animals that are considered impure, right? I don't think there's any kind of halachic reason for why you can't have a pet. I, mean, I think it's actually can, psychological. I, I was going to say you can't walk a dog on Shabbos, right? In, in, if there's no Eruv. So you could maybe have a yard where the dog can go outside. You could maybe have a child or maybe, you know, maybe pe well, people who use Eruv. Um, and there's plenty of people who use Eruv who also don't have dogs. Now, there are more dogs in the from world. And I remember when we got a from neighbor who had a dog who basically was trying to hide this dog from the neighbors. Really? Like, had a it, secret it, is, pet. In your childhood in Borough Park? In my childhood and when my parents moved to Kensington, which is the next neighborhood over. Um, and my friend Malka told me that they had a cat in their house 
and her father would only touch the cat with the newspaper. But the father loved the cat so much that he would spend a really long time like scratching the cat Aww. and touching it with the newspaper. Um, so I, th there doesn't seem to be, in other words, we're talking here about a psychological phenomenon, not a phenomenon of Jewish law. With Jewish law, at least some people could have worked their way around it. It was much more than that, um, or much less than that. In other words, if you want, if you wanted to have a dog, and be orthodox, there are probably ways to do it, at least for some people. Um, and yet, the taboo went beyond the the whole question of religious law. So, what are the psychological? Um, what what are your guesses? Are the psychological? So um, it's I, I've been reading a very interesting book written in, it was published in 1935 in Yiddish, which was um, by Max Weinreich, who was Freud's the, uh, the the founder of modern Yiddish studies, the director of YIVO, right. who um, which Freud served on the board of YIVO, so there was a connection with Freud. Um, there was also a connection with race studies. Um, he uh, So Max Weinreich spent time studying psychoanalysis, and he also spent time um, in the American South talking to scholars of the African-American experience. Um, and he came up with a kind of uh, psychoanalytic sociology of Jewish identity um, and trying to understand what constitutes Jewishness in a way that's, that doesn't have to do with praying to God or religious beliefs or keeping law, something that's deeper than that, something that's transmitted even before language. Um, and the best example that he came up with was the fear of dogs. Um, and that was the example for what he thought was past from parent to child. And he also wanted to know where it came from, but he wanted to know both where it came from and how it was transmitted um, without religion, you know, through touch almost. Um, so he for said- Osmosis it, it, sort of. He actually, what he said is that the, the mother carrying a small child- um, In her womb? A Jewish, a, no, no, a, a baby, an infant. So he didn't think it was, he didn't think Jewishness, he wasn't looking for genetic factors. Right, right. He was looking for Cultural. intergenerational transmission through culture. And he said very early, before the child knows the word Jew or the word dog, the mother will be holding the child and walking through a non-Jewish neighborhood and suddenly like she'll hold him tighter or her tighter and the baby will feel the mother's fear Anxiety. and hear the dogs barking. And associate the barking And associate the dogs barking with the mother's fear appropriately. Or a little older be walking with the father to shul and feel the, the father's grip, grip tighten. Um, so this is something that he considered to be just a deep, deep, deep Jewish trait. But he also recognized, and he and <clears throat> he wanted to know where it came from, and he hypothesized that it had to do with Jewish occupational patterns, that Jews tended to be merchants as opposed to farmers, or um, I see landowners. Well, I see or, animal husbandry. That... Right, they didn't have much to do with animals, so a bit, you know, animals had. Jobs. I mean, animals took care of other animals. Dogs took care of animals, or dogs guarded the periphery the of an estate or a farm, right? In exchange for scraps. I mean, that's what dogs did back in in the day, and dogs basically were um, trained to bark at anyone walking by, and the Jew was somebody walking by, a peddler or. So, so this there's an old, for you know, for Weinreich, a historical, sociological, economic reason that dogs and Jews were not on good terms, and that even after Jews worked as peddlers going from estate to estate, 
um, and they were in different kinds of businesses, these traits continued. And the, the Jewish fear and aversion um, to dogs is something that was passed along unconsciously for, you know, centuries. Well, that is so interesting. You know, I, I want to back up for a minute. It, must, it was my assumption that the aversion to animal, uh, pe to pets, was a post-Holocaust New York creation. Hasidim came to New York, no longer needed to have close contact with animals, no longer lived in close contact with animals as they did before the war, and, and a fear of animals developed from lack of exposure. But this, what you're saying, is a Jewish, has been a Jewish pattern going back. According to Weinreich, this is, you know, he considered this like a primer. If, if you were afraid of dogs, it was like a good, um, you know, a good chance that you had some like very basic primal Jewish stuff transmitted to you in very early years. He saw this as a kind of primary example of the intergenerational transmission of Jewishness. Um, wow. The idea and he actually said that he thought it persisted among American Jews, even after they had assimilated, lost Yiddish. He said that he, it, 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 he wrote this, that if he wanted to know how Jewish somebody was, he wouldn't ask him how much Yiddish they knew, he would ask him if they were afraid of dogs. Wow. Uh, the idea and by the way, Jew, uh, dogs and blacks suffered similar, I mean, there were dogs that were trained to bark at black people in the South, to control them, to guard them. Dogs were used in, uh, you know, slave economies. So, um, there's a similar Weinreich pattern. discovered a kind of overlap in this too, of this kind of relationship with dogs. Wow. The, the popular conception that a Jewish feature, Jewishness, is fear of dogs. I, I have never heard of it. I have never heard of someone who says, I'm, I'm a Jewish person and this is a Jewish feature. I remember when I first started uh, graduate school and I talk like this a lot. And I remember one of my professors, she was Jewish and she said, you talk like this. And I, and I learned then that this is a Jewish feature. It's talk with your hands a lot. But in, in the popular, um, it's sort of a, mm -hmm. a, a, a a stereotype, let's say. I have never heard of the idea of Jews being afraid of dogs going together. This seems to have been erased from the stereotype. Yes, exactly. Weinreich recognized that the transformation of uh, Jewish culture was happening at a really rapid pace. And one of the ways that this was evident to him was the sudden popularity of uh, dogs and other pets in Jewish homes. And um, as a matter of fact, Freud is an example of this because um, Ernest Jones, Freud's um, student and biographer, um, who was not Jewish, but who was married to a Jewish woman, um, says in his biography of Freud, that Freud was similar to other Jews of his generation in that he was completely uninterested in dogs and actually made a crack that um, he was uh, something about fox hunting and he, he was as interested in dogs as he was in fox hunting or something like that, like the most guyish thing you could think of. Um, and this, you know, this is something that struck Jones and he remembered and then when Freud was when Freud was in his seventies, his early seventies, his daughter um, Anna, also a psychoanalyst, um, took up hiking and loved to go hiking by herself, and would occasionally get into iffy situations. Uh -huh. And her family decided that she needed a dog, uh -huh. and got her this big wolfhound called Wolfie. Um, and Freud was exposed for the first time like to a dog in his house and his family and fell in love with this dog and thereafter became like an insane dog lover, was basically converted to dog Doggy. love um, and had a series of dogs, all white chows. Um, the middle one was his favorite. Her name was Yofi, Hebrew name. Hebrew name. Yofi is in beautiful as in... 
Yes. So Freud himself underwent this kind of, and, and all the people around him recognized this as a, as a Jewish a, a, a phenomenon with Jewish significance, that a Jewish woman going out to hike would have a big dog to protect her. You know, this is in the, um, I think it's in the, I'm trying to remember if it's already in the 30s and, you know, this anti-Semitism. But Freud was so in love with his dog that he was, um, supposed to get a uh, the Royal Academy Medal. And the Royal Academy Medal is a big ceremony to go with it. And, um, you know, you get a whatever. It's, it's a, huge it's a huge honor. And Freud said, I, I'm too sick to go. And instead of going to the ceremony to get the medal, he went to visit his dog in quarantine. Why was his dog in quarantine? Because he brought the dog from Vienna to London, and the rule was that if you bring a dog across the national border, it has to be quarantined so to make sure it doesn't have some disease. horrible new disease. So it was in quarantine, and um, Freud missed this dog very much. And wow. when you read... Um, summaries of what it was like to be analyzed by Freud after this period in the 30s, the do there was always a dog in the session. Really? And supposedly the dog knew, yeah, and, the, and Freud would, yeah, one, one person who wrote a very detailed description of being analyzed by Freud, they all mentioned the dog, said that um, she started getting jealous of the dog because she thought that Freud was more interested in the dog than he was in her. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> that's uh, an interesting uh, work ethic. <laughs> you bring your uh, your dog. Bring to your dog to day. work. Yeah, every which day. Which I've done. I've done. <laughs> yeah, I hear you. I haven't done it, but I didn't have the kind of dog that you could do it with. <laughs> well, I had a do so so the way I got my my dog, my first dog, was I was living in Jerusalem, and there was a peeping tom, and. Um, how come uh, you were living in Jerusalem? I was uh, on, I had some kind of fellowship to study at Hebrew University, nice. studying Bible translation. Oh, nice. And um, I, the police came and, you know, took a report and I said, what can I do? And they, they said, you can get a dog. So if you feel that's one way to, the dog will know that there's a, you know, the peeping Tom is there and will start barking. And I was so uninterested in dogs. I mean, this was purely just following wow. the police orders that I sent a friend of mine to the pound with instructions to get the biggest dog there. <laughs> How big was the dog? She was huge. She was like the kind of dog where you could dance with her. Right, she right, her right. Paws. When she gets up on her hind legs, just she reaches right, your shoulders. It, like she was my height. Like wow. she just put her paws on my shoulders and we would do a oh, little I dance. <laughs> and I... I fell in love with this dog. I don't know what to say. This was just like, I loved this dog so much. Name? I didn't know it was possible to love another being to the extent that I loved this dog. What was her name? Her name was Kadya. Kadya? Why Kadya? She was named after a Yiddish poet named Kadya Moldovsky, uh -huh. who wrote a, a poem suite called um, Freien Lieder, Women Women's Songs. Songs. Wow. What, what was and her breed, Kadya? She was, um, you know, I'm sure she wasn't anything fancy. I mean, I got her at the pound. She was a mix of things. She may have been, uh, what's, so there's, I don't know if you know, but, um, there's a book that just came out. Turns out that despite the fact that, as I just said, there's this whole history of Jews and dogs of not being good friends, one of the most important people who, um, trained modern dogs, for all kinds of, you know, like to do army work and police work and um, seeing eye dogs also, was a Jewish woman, actually a Zionist, named Rudolfina Menzel, who, um, who, who trained all the dogs in the German police force and the army, very creepy, I know, and then herself had to leave Europe. Wow. Um, but she actually trained um, her dogs in Hebrew because she was a Zionist so that the German police dogs were trained to answer Hebrew commands. This is just a weird little wow. footnote yeah. of this story. Of so, so 
you know, in the 20th century, what dogs were um, and what they were for and what jobs they had started to change very dramatically. And it was in this period that they also really became pets, um, you know, that, that, you know, urban pets. Um, and that kind of, whatever that culture was, was something that Jews began to participate in. So it wasn't just people who own a farm, people who own an estate, but, you know, just a, a nuclear family in an apartment would want to have a dog. So um, Freud, Freud joined that bandwagon. Uh -huh. What was Freud, did Freud have anything to say about his own Jewishness and pets? Did he psychoanalyze himself on that? So the craziest part of this story is, um, and I write about this in my book, is that Freud, Freud um, only psychoanalyzed one child, um, other than his own daughter, and he only wrote up one, psych one analysis of a child. And as it happened, this was a Jewish child who was really afraid of horses, um, had a phobia of horses and didn't want to go out on the street. And that's his, the, his parents, consult, his name was, the, um, the case study is Little Hans. Wow. And so Freud's whole, like, study of, of little children's and their fear of animals um, was basically exactly. revolved around the little Hans story. I mean, the other interesting thing about little Hans is little Hans is also the only case study that talks about anti-Semitism in a footnote. So where Freud's talking about anti-Semitism in this kind of weird and indirect way. And also turns out little Hans was a family friend and little Hans's father when he was born, asked Freud whether he should have him baptized um, so that he wouldn't suffer from anti-Semitism. And Freud said, it doesn't really matter if you baptize him or not, because he'll suffer from anti-Semitism in any case. And if you stay Jewish, then being Jewish is actually a kind of help for the wounds of anti-Semitism, psychological help. To, to Hans um, himself? What? To Hans himself. To Hans. That if Hans, um, if Hans is Jewish, he'll be able to cope with anti-Semitism better than if he's not. If he's a converted Jew who don't have any of the, um, of the energy, and Freud called it, to deal with anti-Semitism. And... One of the things I do in the last chapter of the book is bring Freud together with Weinreich, who's also talking about kids and their fear of animals. And wait, 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 wait. You're talking about a book? My book, yeah, yeah sorry. Yeah, you didn't, you didn't mention you have a book on yes. Freud. <laughs> I have a book on Freud and Jewish languages. Sorry, does it sound like I'm giving an academic lecture? No, no, no. I, th I think we should explain your, your work. You've done work on Freud, and we should backtrack and explain your book. Yeah. So my book is about um, the Hebrew and Yiddish in Freud. So he, he has these little phrases and how he relates to Yiddish and his relationship with the Hebrew and Yiddish translators of his work. And then it's about the Hebrew and Yiddish translations of his work. So it's about Hebrew and Yiddish as a kind of connective tissue between Jews and Freud. Um, I see you know, how Freud signals to them and, you know, how he talks about being Jewish. And, and then it's also about how certain of his translators related to his work, given their shared Jewishness. And the last chapter of the book is about um, Freud's main Yiddish translator, this guy Weinreich, who, aside from having translated Freud into Yiddish, also wrote this whole psychoanalytic study of of what it meant to be Jewish, a Jewish child, basically. Um, so he, he has a long, long book about things like Jewish anim, animal phobias and the transmission of Jewishness from one generation to another, etc. And Freud, on the other hand, has a little case study about this one boy who happens to be Jewish and he hints a little bit that there might be some Jewish relevance to his phobia. So I, I basically do the work of trying to get these 
people to talk to each other, Freud and Weinreich, um, uh-huh. because by the time, you know, they, I, I don't know if they ever met, I know they corresponded, but there isn't any evidence that they ever met, or that and Freud wasn't able to read Weinreich's work, so what might Freud have learned from Weinreich? And, you know, Weinreich really explains what it is that Jewishness has to offer um, that that combats anti-Semitism. Like, all Freud said was, Judaism has things to offer that will help you deal with anti-Semitism that you lose if you don't have any connection to Judaism or to Jews. Um, so and- if you... If you are baptized, then you lose the strength that Jewishness gives you, which is an offhand comment that Weinreich actually spends like many, many pages parsing without having read what Weinreich, what, what Freud said. He talks about how anti-Semitism is a wound, an ego wound, and that Judaism is basically a form of compensation. Like, and he says what the old compensation was, you're the chosen people, God loves you, uh, you're special. Um, and he says in the modern period, none of those religious aspects really work anymore. Like they don't, you know, people don't believe that God chose them and um, they don't like to sort of really openly say we're better than the guy in, you know, that kind of thing. So he says that instead of that, the new secular compensations are famous Jews. Successful Jews. Like Jews that won Nobel Prizes, Freud. and look how many uh, Nobel Prize winners there are among Jews. He actually says, and then he says, and look how many famous people there are among Jews. And then he he starts listing all the famous Jews, which everybody back in the twenties and thirties, this was a huge thing. The ten most famous Jews, like we think it was invented now, but it actually goes back to the twenties and the thirties. Um, like this idea that they're, that the Jews are just, you know, Nobel Prize winning doctors and lawyers and all that. Um, you know, Freud and Einstein and Marx and Spinoza and all the great, brilliant people are Jewish. I see. Very interesting. But there's there's nothing, it doesn't bring us around in any which way to dogs being a salve to, to anti-Semitism. So the dogs are... He says that, that, that the new forms of being Jewish are basically um, related to these new forms of like Jewish pride and Jewish nationalism, and that, that Jewish pride is a, a kind of um, the opposite of the Jewish fear and Jewish passivity and Jewish... And Jewish passivity and fear is what is part of what the the belief that you can never win against a non-Jew and the non-Jew with the dog, the best you can hope for is to run away, I you see. know, say something under your breath. Um, so the the new, the new willingness Jews. to look at non-Jews and see yourself as the same species is and is also related to the new willingness to look at dogs and be able to imagine them as with inside a Jewish home, as opposed to just the kind of terror outside of it. Wow. I feel like you're almost saying a devar, Naomi. It's, it's so satisfying the way you brought it all around. Back to, <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying to work out this chapter right now. I'm actually writing this chapter. It's a crazy chapter because what it does is it, it takes something that Weinreich wrote and something that Freud wrote, and it kind of like reads Weinreich through Freud and Freud through Weinreich. So I talk about it as like, I'm reading from right to left and left to right and producing some kind of conversation between two men who never really met. It's very interesting. Yeah, Weinreich knew Freud's work, obviously, but it wasn't mutual. Yeah. Very interesting. The whole idea of, um, personally, when I think about the Zionist movement, the new Jew, the reinvention, rethinking a Jew and dogs, I could see how they could be in one family. I could see, uh, considering how you framed it, I could see. um, And in that note, I can see why also for me as an OTD person, uh, an ex person who has a little bit of that new Jew draw, you know? Um, I can see why 
the journey of getting an animal and getting going from being afraid and jumping away from from dogs and you know even if you want to pet it you pet it from a distance and the moment the dog moves you run away um <laughs> to to loving that animal so deeply you you can't wait to get home and and see him at the window um i i i feel like i feel like it it charts for me a little bit of that journey of rethinking my own I, I wouldn't call it my own Jewishness but maybe in the way we framed the conversation I would almost say that yeah I feel the same way I feel the same way and you know it's it's really sweet to me that um, you know your mother like saw that you know what you had with Snoopy and I had another experience like that weirdly I had a, a student um, in, uh, I, I taught a class, Introduction to Judaism, that was like mostly for non-Jews when I was a teacher at the, at the GTU, mostly for people in the Christian seminaries. And there was a student in one of my classes, and I, and I brought in, there was this Hasidic man, this Hasidic Rebbe, actually, who had some kind of little following in Berkeley, like Balei Tshuva, but he was a real Eastern European rebel, rebel uh, you know, lived in Bar Park, had a thick Yiddish accent, immigrant, Eastern European immigrant. I think his, he was the Sambora Rebbe. His name was Rabbi Yoilis. And I, he was in town and, you know, you can imagine how poor he was. I gave him a little honorarium to come speak to my class the wow. first day. And um, in the class was this woman who and who was in a wheelchair, I remember. And um in while he was talking, I noticed that she was like a tear ran down her face. And I think he noticed too afterwards, and when the class was over, he went over to her and he said, Are are you okay? And she said, I'm so sorry, I'm just a wreck. My dog just died. Oh no. And he said, and my first thought was, he's not going to be sympathetic, right? It's yeah. He's just going to be like, a dog, bleh, or whatever. But no, he was, he, he said something like, dogs, what, what a special relationship that is, right? And yeah. he's looking at her, wow. and she goes, yes. And I just remember feeling that as such a healing moment, like whatever yeah. else he said, you know, the Jews are this, the Jews are that, but that ability to like reach out and hear and see someone's sadness yeah. over you know the loss of their dog i felt like this this is what this is what he gets when he comes to berkeley when he leaves borough park and he comes to berkeley and he meets people like that and he stretches i mean he was a, a had a huge soul yeah um, but certainly he stretched it to yeah. to to meet her that, that you know my experience with having a dog um, and, and, you know, talking about that dog to my family, especially as he started to get older, he was, he died of cancer suddenly. So uh, he wasn't like old and, and wobbly. It was, a, it was one minute he's fine. And the next minute we're, we're being told to euthanize him. But I, he started to have certain health issues. He had a, a torn ligament. He needed extensive surgery. And it, it was so much weighing on me, the costs, the worries, seeing that, that poor animal trying to get onto the bed and not being able to get on the bed. It was so weighing on me that I couldn't resist telling my family, even though until then I would never mention my dog. It felt so weird to mention a dog. Uh, to uh, that even when I was talking to my mother on the phone and, and the dog would go crazy barking because someone was going by, God forbid someone go by the window, he would go crazy barking. My mother would say, what's going on? And, and I would say, nothing, nothing. But once it was so weighing on me, I couldn't resist telling my mother and, and telling my grandmother. And uh, something that was very interesting was everyone tried you know like my my mother when i told her that my dog passed away she i feel like she was really at a loss for what to say i mean we're eating globs of chicken all the time we're killing animals all the time and and suddenly this animal is so important it's almost like a human passed away but on the other hand like her first reaction was oh yo i i I once found a bird on the on the road and I tried to nurse it back to life and when it passed away I promised myself I'll never even have a goldfish like she understood 
so deeply that animals dying is is so painful but then she also i felt like she was trying to say something and she ended up telling me that that everything is bashit which i found so interesting and so strange to fit it with a dog she said everything's bashit and it, it, sometimes people get reincarnated and and I, I swear this is so uncharacteristic of my mother but she she said you know this was bashit for the dog it it, it was it, it was sweet. It was because... destined. It was the fate. Just to translate for your listeners. Yes, yes, it was for the your fate. Your thousands of listeners. Yeah, which I would like to believe it was fate. I find it actually comforting because something I find running through my mind is, could I have caught the cancer? Something I, I wish I had from my mother is this fate. It, it's bashit. We cannot control the world. We can't run to doctors a million times and prevent horrible diseases. We can't blame ourselves. Ultimately, it's meant to be. We have to accept a certain degree, and and I wish I could carry that with me. Like I feel like yeah. it makes her life, it, it makes it it relieves a burden. So the yeah, I was just I think this is related. Like the way I fell in love with my dog, I don't is is because so so I get this dog that's supposed to be taking care of me. Right. It's supposed gotcha. to serve me, and. I'm told, so my roommate or my housemate, my guest actually comes back with the biggest dog she can find and and with instructions that I'm supposed to go to the vet and make sure it's okay. And I go to the vet and I find out that my dog has an obstructed bowel, wow. distemper, and there was one other thing, I forget what. And the distemper meant that which is very contagious it's a bad contagion contagious disease among dogs meant that my dog couldn't be allowed out when it was around any other dogs so i could only take it for like a long walk at night like at midnight wow. i could take it um and then because it had an obstructed bowel it could only eat um chicken breast with no bone and no skin and you know expensive stuff the most expensive meat um and i should feed it like very gradated and basically what i acquired was something i had to take care of um and suddenly i was like taking oh and i also had to go to the vet every other day for a shot oh my god so first of all i was super poor and second of all, I had to take my dog in a cab oh my to the God. vet. So I went from like, get me any dog, I don't give a shit, just give me a big dog, to suddenly taking care of this dog, like, all the time. And um, I basically, for, like, the first month that this dog was with me, and it was, couldn't look at me, couldn't make eye contact, and had its tail between its legs. And over the course of taking care of this dog, I basically fell deeply, deeply in love with the dog. Wow. So the, you know, and, and then the dog, like, got better, which was astonishing because it could have easily not. And it's like its tail came up and, like, then uh. it was like that. And, and then it just became, like, the best dog like i didn't even need a leash it would come running whenever i called the instant i called and basically would spend like i couldn't bear to be parted from her so i would take her to work and i would hide her where she wasn't allowed i worked in an office and i would hide her oh, under the desk yeah. and she would stay under the desk where she took up almost all the room down there <laughs> and i would have my feet in her fur and i would just like play with, a, with, with a fur. her fur, just the whole work day. Oh, do you have a picture of you and the dog? I don't think I do. She was beautiful. You asked about her breed, what kind of breed she was. So one of the things is this woman I was telling you about, Rudolfina Menzel, yeah. who trained all the dogs. She's the one who really worked on a lot of different kinds of figuring out breeds. And she actually invented a breed called the Canaanite. Um, okay, interesting. Which was basically the dogs that were in Palestine when she moved there in 1938, which were what's called either village dogs or pariah dogs, which is like totally fierce dogs, full of parasites, 
live like two or three years, you know, live on garbage or else work around animals, like not pets. And in order to do her work in Palestine, she brought four boxers, but boxers don't do well in that weather. She needed to domesticate. She, she needed not only canine. herself to domesticate the local dogs, she needed everyone to domesticate the local dogs because she needed a population that she could train for the army, for the seeing eye. I told you that was a big part of what she did. So she basically had to train Jews to train dogs, to have pets, etc. And she worked like super hard to get into, you know, packs and try to, you know, basically domesticate. She basically domesticated, a, you know, the dogs around Tel Aviv. Wow. Well, and then, how is that related? you know, people. Sorry. How's that related to what? To your dog. Are you oh, talking because about I inherited, by the time I got a dog in Israel, um, this was a dog who had come from the stock. Of Canaanites. She, you know, my, she might have been a Canaanite. I don't know. I never found out. But Canaanites are not, as my friend Sukhan, who, who is, you know, a, a researcher in this field, um, Canaanites is kind of like an imaginary breed. It's just whatever mix of dogs were there. And she also invented this whole mythology that this is where dogs were originally domesticated. So this is like the first breed of domesticated dog which probably isn't true, but it goes along with some kind of Zionist ethos yeah, of that. like, so, so that's, so yeah, maybe I had a Canaanite. I'm not really sure. Cause I didn't, I, I don't think I knew what that breed was back then. You don't have any pictures. If you can fish up a picture, we'll add it into the video. I could show you this particular dog. We want to see have your now. dog. Have you had a dog between, is it Katya? Is it? Kadia, and now Kadia. we have Vanessa. Vanessa. We have Vanessa a month before the pandemic. Oh, look at that tail. <laughs> so first I have to tell you, oops, let me put on my... So Vanessa was super happy. She was on the couch um, um, under the blanket that my son was also under. Oh, Mwah. she's so cute. She, she allows herself to be covered by the blanket. It's her favorite spot. She has such a Basically, derpy face. In between, like in between my legs, under the blanket is where she feels best. Oh, right? look at the way Vanessa? she's looking at you. She Aww. has very intense eye contact. That's amazing. That's amazing. <laughs> <laughs> You're holding her like a baby. That's what we do. We, yeah. you know, she is so. What is it? So devoted to us. So yeah. just. As you could like looking at us, even though she's really not happy here, she would much rather be underneath the blanket and she probably will still be there. Okay. And by the way, we didn't name her. Um, when we picked her out at the vet, basically at the pound, basically my son just looked right at her and, you know, pointed to her and that was that. Um, and then as we're leaving, you know, she has this folder and it says Vanessa and we asked the woman behind the desk, is that her name? Like, can we give her another name? And she shrugged and she goes, Vanessa. And Vanessa looked up at her. So we're like, okay, I guess her name is Vanessa. So okay. that's how she got her name. I like it. We also, our dog also came with the name Snoopy. So. Oh, really? Yeah. We didn't pick such a corny name. He was such the best dog. Name. She is also the best dog. <laughs> oh, she's so funny. She's so cute. Hi, Vanessa. I don't think dogs can pick up... Um, uh, video. Pictures. They can't make out. I know. Screens. We really have to. Yeah. Yeah. Thinking, okay, she really I'm, wants I'm to go back. All right. We're not. We're not fine. I will give you a treat, Vanessa, when I meet you in person. <laughs> to to pay. Yeah, I can assure you, she is not deprived. She's not deprived. Thank you. I believe she's not deprived. <laughs> you know the way you hold her like a baby reminds me also. Um, that I think a part of why a lot of Hasidic people don't have dogs is simply because there is yeah, a, babies. there's babies. Yeah. In fact, I was told so many times, don't, don't have two things. I get told all the time. Don't have a dog. You need a ba You need babies. Don't have a dog. Don't have a dog. You need a husband. That's what people tell me all the time. <laughs> and I do think that dogs fill a certain, um, opening that is available that, that you don't have when you have a bunch of babies. 
Exactly. Though, if you had a bunch of babies, it would be fun to also have a dog. I think probably, so. You know, I think for everybody so. involved. Yeah, but it's a lot of work. You know, one person can only do so much work. It's true. My sister says it gets much easier after the first five. <laughs> after the first five. That's a lot of work to get to the sixth. <laughs> that's, that's quite... It's like by the time you have a sixth baby, you just throw the baby into the pile and just... <laughs> you know, you have one kid, you spend all this time entertaining a child. Yeah. And, you know, if there's six of them, you know, the, it, the entertainment aspect of it is completely, you know, finding things. You just... They're entertained. It's also that the older ones help with the younger ones. It's oh, like yeah. Completely I know. Different. I used to like go into my sister's house and it'd be like 11 year old frying an egg for a three year old, you know? Yeah, and yeah. And I go, Where's your mother? And they're like, oh, I think she's in bed reading. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's how we grew up. That's what I see in, in Hasidic Williamsburg all the time. And people are really impressed with seeing so many children pushing strollers of younger children, very young children already bossing up a little bit and you know helping with the younger children like look at me yeah, yeah. well I was the youngest so I didn't have any oh, experience in that I am the fifth of 15 so I've experienced the whole the whole thing but wow yeah wow yeah. so someone actually um commented on a recent video I did that they had home economics in there it was I think a, a catholic school where the children learned how to hold a baby and take care of a baby and it occurred to me that we had all of that at home like everyone I knew was learning how to hold a baby even if you were the youngest you had nieces and nephews and you knew how to right. change a diaper and yeah I had I was babysitting I, I once was babysitting not only my sister's kids, my sister had seven kids, but also like the neighbor's kids, like a whole bunch of kids on Shabbos afternoon when the parents were asleep, you know that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like I was 16 or 15 or 12. I don't, I, I don't remember how old I was, but I was the oldest one, so I was in charge when this kid fell out the window. Oh, no. Yeah. I mean, survived and... Um, is fine. I actually went, ended up going OTD and I ended up meeting him in Berkeley, like, you know, 20 years later. He also went OTD? Yeah. Wow. <laughs> One of the few people that I knew when I was growing up who also went OTD. How high but he's was okay. the window? He's okay now. But um, yeah, that was something like just, Scary. you know, I mean, yeah, That's... like being in charge of kids when you're yourself sort yeah, of a kid that's... and so many could you like even now like taking care of like eight kids yeah that's so scary how high up were you guys we were I mean it was the first floor but it was a little higher than a typical first floor it was kind of like an old house where the first floor is pretty high uh-huh it's funny I fell out of a window too I don't know these like you know I don't know if they're more common but you hear um Basia Schachter talks about how, you know, whatever it was, eight, nine kids in her family, and they came back from the country in the in the station wagon, and her brother was, like, asleep in the, the very back of the station wagon, and that last row where you look out the back window. Yeah, yeah. And they left him in there all night. They forgot him. Oh, no. Did he survive? Yeah, he survived. He just slept in a car on a Brooklyn street. Oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, my God. <laughs> I guess these things happen with kids, Yeah, it right? happens. You know what? Which is why you should have extras. Oh, God. <laughs> there was a woman I once went, I'll never forget, I was doing my blood work, um, and, and the nurse who took my blood said, one child? One child is not good. I had one child only, and he got killed in a car accident. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God. People are so, it's so funny. It's like, one is not enough, and... Three is too many. It's yeah. like a very exact number you should have. Yeah, yeah. You know what? I, I personally, I think to each its own, and different people. One zero, you know, different. I, I respect all sorts of families. I think different things work for different people. I don't like it when we feel a sense of pushing what we need on others, which I feel like is so prevalent. I, I, I do it even with dogs. I have a friend who doesn't like dogs and I'm like, you must like dogs. You cannot not like dogs, but I I, I know that, you yeah. know. Yeah. It's just, does not like dogs. Really? And does like, is somewhat bemused by me. Like just can't believe that I have, I mean, we have our dog and we also have our housemate's dog. 
Right. So, you know, I go out with the dogs. There's a beautiful place to where the dogs can go off leash, like a very wild place near my house. I mean, 10 minute drive. And we try to go, I mean, we try to get out with the dogs for a real run every day. And I feel so lucky to live someplace where we can do that, you know, someplace beautiful. And it's also great exercise for me. I mean, when I, you know, every day go for a hour long walk yeah, with, you know, amazing. someplace wild. It's amazing. It, it It's supposed to keep you in shape. I don't know. I see so many people manage to walk a half a block with their dog and go back home. Yeah. Yeah. I, and Vanessa would be totally happy with that. She's like, okay, we've gone far enough. How She's really she? not into it. But our housemate's dog is like, you know, zoomers all around. How old's and Vanessa? just seeing it is good for the soul. What is good for the soul? Seeing a dog like racing around in circles and yeah, that running up the hill. Yeah, that energy eating with that appetite. <laughs> right. Though it's also like, like one of the reasons why we were like hesitant about getting a dog is that you just, you walk into a room where the dog's been sitting on the couch for like 10 hours and you just feel so guilty. Yeah. I don't know about you, but. Yeah. I never left my dog. I didn't travel. We had our dog almost 10 years and he was not the kind of dog you could leave behind. He would cry and I just didn't travel and I was very, I was very much a homebody because I couldn't afford kenneling him and I, I. I just couldn't do it to him to be out of the house too much. It's it's painful to see the animals cooped up. Yeah. Anyway, I yeah. wanna I wanna let you go. Thank you so much for this fascinating conversation. And and um, for your kind words about about my dog, which I really appreciate. Because I, it's still so fresh. I, I, when I eat, I expect him to put his snout on my lap, which is what he always did. You know, these forms of habit that are created in relationships. It's, yeah. it's hard. Yeah. yeah. And how lucky we are to have these animals in our lives, right? They're so, they're so amazing. And they're so, I don't know, noble. And yeah. there's something so special about them. Yeah, I do. I mean, in general, it's like you fall in love with one and you just fall in love with the whole All dogs. Everywhere species. you look, you see, you see dogs and you, and you yeah. get it. I feel like you really have to have a dog to understand how dogs are. They're not humans. There's something very different and yet something very... I yeah, know. maybe I'll just say one more thing, which is one of the things I realized when I had a dog is that I always thought it's like, you know, I go through life looking for love, like other people to love me or other, you know, that it's all for me. And when I had a dog, I realized that actually what I really want is to be able to love as completely and fully as I love this dog. And I just feel like you can't do it with people because they would be so freaked out at like the oceans of love. They would just... They would have to run in the other direction. I mean, I wrote songs for my dog. I mean, my love for her was just, you know, you, you couldn't you couldn't put that on a person. Yeah. What happened to Gadia? I gave her, so before I left Israel, I gave her to a friend of mine. And because I had all these things to take care of, I um, I gave her away like two weeks before I left to somebody who lived on the other end of town and she found her way back to me. Wow. And then I actually was staying with another friend the last couple of days before I got on a plane and she found her way back to me again. Wow. And then I, one of the things I discovered after um, at the end of my stay there is that there were all these people in the neighborhood who knew her, who would take her in and she would you know, they would feed her, she would hang out with them. She was kind of like Everyone. friendly with all kinds of people in the neighborhood. And she, like at one point I brought her back, like as I was getting on the plane and she left this friend that I gave her to. And I just hope and assume she was at some other house, you know, with some other friend of hers, because I, I don't know what happened to her after that. Wow. She, 
couldn't come back, unfortunately. You were too far. She didn't she come walked. back, no. She would have walked. She would have swam the whole ocean. She would have swam to the United States of America yeah. to find me. Yeah. Wonderful. Well, uh, you want to tell the viewers where they can find your work so they can learn more about uh, your wonderful work, your book on Freud, which I guess is still in... in it's not out yet, right? So... Um, if you're, you, I have a podcast which is called Heretic in the House, which you already mentioned, and I'm also interviewed by you, and I interview you in case this isn't enough of people scratching each other's backs, <laughs> and um, so that's you know on podcasts wherever, and our interview is on YouTube, and my I also have a website devoted to my. Um, research into Orthodox, an uh, Orthodox Jewish girls' school system called Beis Yaakov, which Frida has also contributed to, and that's called the Beis Yaakov Project.com. And probably only people who know what Beis Yaakov is would be interested, so I'll just leave it Everyone at that. Everyone should be interested. Everybody <laughs> should be interested in, in it. And it's wonderful to talk to you. Wonderful. Thank you. Nomi, and thank you everyone. Uh, I'll be linking the videos that Nomi mentioned, and thank you all for watching.